This is an approximation of the first sounds you ever heard. They're the sounds of your mother's body. Her beating heart, her breathing, her stomach, and the sound of blood gurgling down your umbilical cord. At six weeks, the idea of ears start to bud when you're no larger than a pea in a pod. By week 18, you'll have started listening, and ten weeks after, your heart will beat faster when you recognize the voice of your mother reverberating through her body, her bones amplifying her utterance like the soul's subwoofer. We all entered this life crying. Tears, it's how you know you're living. Breathing 20,000 times per day, it's all so easy. Coughing, clearing your own airways, and getting a pat on the back for burping. But at the end of your life, after you lose your power of speech, you'll be too tired for coughing. It's the last thing to go after your ability to swallow. Sitting by Venka's bed, listening to death rattle about in his chest, willing him to cough, wishing I could do it for him. But it's never the dying person's job to fix your loss of them. Silence isn't the absence of something. Silence. It's the presence of everything. Listening is the last thing you'll do before you die. Your eyes will close, so will your nose. Your touch numbs as your body wastes. And there's no need for tasting, but sound continues. Your last rite will fall, not on your deaf ear but will trickle in. Before we reach the period at the end of our life sentence, before the full stop, you are still here, hearing. Venka's dying wish was to do it alone. But yesterday, Dr. Tarn phoned. Yes, he had asked for no visitors, no witnesses. But as previously discussed, I was to sit at his bedside, not in my capacity as a field recordist, but as a sound technician, to play the auditory inventory he'd recorded, so that his wife could find his deathbed amongst the resting, nesting places of the other hospice residents. Life had separated them, Venka and Shruti, now in death, he would call her from Yama's side, back to him. Traveling through Hell's halls, making it out alive, reincarnated together, he would summon her by listing her pleasures. And so I pressed play, eavesdropping. First, confessions, followed by the list disjointed like his breathing, never knowing where the next one was coming from or if it would come at all. I keep telling the palliative care therapists that the only person I want to talk to about my grief is you. I loved you more than my own hands more than my own mouth, my eyes. Shruti, your death. I couldn't grasp its permanence. I read all your books on the bookshelf, all the annals and advice for future corpses. 
I read the Kubler Ross woman, and much like my own grief, couldn't get past the chapter of denial. If that Kubler Ross woman spent the last nine years of her life paralyzed in anger, I realized it was okay never reaching acceptance. Shruti, I couldn't stand the silence. No, that's not. I couldn't. I couldn't stand the sound of just me in the house without you around. Everything was out of tune, amplified in solitude. The dissonance of just one person breathing, painful, glacial. When death cut our divine thread of togetherness, the house began inhaling and exhaling when you didn't. Your presence hung in the apartment like perfume. I tried to sniff you out like a person lost in a quiet library, tense, rigid, shallow breathing. I confess, I once opened your half of the wardrobe and turned on the standing fan just to hear your saris rustling again. But all I heard was the jingle jangle of the coat hangers, a trousseau wind chime. I confess that I once stood at the kitchen bench and pulled out the cutlery drawer over and over, just trying to get the right speed of your six o'clock body in the morning. I confess, I touched my body with my other hand, using your memory to guide it, and then had to stop because it brought up too much self-loathing. How could my skin have ever given you pleasure when all there is to feel are just dead cells sloughing? I confess, I started talking to myself in the mirror for lack of a recording of your voice. I would repeat snatches of your plaudits verbatim. Hello, handsome, like a prayer, addressing someone who is not there. I confess, I turned the memory of your body over and over, turned you into an object. For what is a body without a person in it? Your hands, your mouth, your collarbone, lifeless, devoid of delight, pornographic. I confess, at night, I would hold my own hand and turn my head to the left away from your pillow in the darkness. The bed was too big without you in it. Grief is as deep as the love it's replaced. Grief, it's not something you do, it does you. I never reach the new normal, Shruti. A world without you in it would always be absurd. When I only knew me in relation to you. I wanted to be smoothed, the way you glided your hand across the bed's new sheets. I wanted to be tucked in and flattened underneath you. I wanted you to sigh, as you did behind the bathroom door getting out of the shower, all wetness and condensation. I wanted to be the reason you dripped. I wanted you to sigh for me, the way you did for the bed, laying down on it, after a hard day's work at hospice. I wanted to be part of that intimate conversation. I wanted you to want me, not because I forced you, but because I was tolerated, not because it was your wifely duty. No, Shruti, I wanted you to want me because I brought you pleasure. 
I wanted you to listen to me the way you gave your ear to children playing in distant playgrounds, to the church bells, to thunder, to the sizzling pan, to the crickets, the frogs, to the wind squeezing itself through the gap between the windowsill and the window. I wanted you to open your ears to me, the way you gave yourself fully to the SCTF public warning system, to the dawn chorus, to the silence under the underpass as we drove through a storm, to the first date conversation of the Tinder match at the table next to us at Starbucks. I wanted to stop you in your tracks, like the way you paused for the flower growing out of the crack in the concrete pavement. Standing in a room, I wanted to be the thing you'd forgotten. And remembering, I wanted to be the reason you walked into the room again to fetch it. I wanted to be smiled at the way you smiled at strangers, at flagpoles and their fluttering every August, at the dustless shelf, the organized cutlery drawer, the last bit of cake, the clouds as the sun set. I wanted you to flirt with me the way you flirted with that dog on the corner, the way you wooed Pierre the cutworm in amongst the basil, the way you toyed with the books at Kinokunya as you chose the one you wanted. I wanted you to nuzzle into me like you did with silk scarves, to smell me the way you did the air after they'd mowed the lawn of the park. I wanted you to luxuriate in me like you did all of life's earthly pleasures, because after death, my love, there is nothingness. You hear that, Yama? I'm coming for you. I'm the lord of my own chariot, my cunning the charioteer steering, my mind whipping the reins, my five horses, the senses heading south, hurtling down roads of my wife's desires. You might have stolen Shruti from me, but I will liberate her from your clutches with pleasures, with perfume and spiced teas, with sand, sea, sunsets, carrying jasmine and daydreams, eucalyptus and sexual interludes, and the worn-out patch of grass under a swing. I am making my way to your horizon with pedicures, antique road shows, and linen handkerchiefs with teaspoons clinking and haircuts, symphonies and curtains whispering. I come carrying radiant memories, mementos of falling leaves, the light of a single lamp in an otherwise dark home, sequin jackets and dancing, mouth-watering flavors and magazine subscriptions. You hear me? coming for my beloved with my fat Trojan horses, thundering like the sea inside a Sitka tree. I pressed play and left Venka to get a coffee, leaving room for silence for the things that cannot be said. I left the recorded past made present to keep vigil, Returning, I found him dead. He had died alone, listening to the sound of the sea reverberating inside a fallen Sitka spruce tree. I thought, you and me, we could listen to it together. 